Hello, my name is Lee Kirksey. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Department of Vascular Surgery here at the Cleveland Clinic. And I'm Sean Lydon. I'm the Chairman of Vascular Surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. So we're here today to uh, discuss a what we feel is an important uh, paper that we recently published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery. Essentially, the paper is a five-year review of the aneurysm, surgical aneurysm experience here at Cleveland Clinic, really our main campus uh, facility, although we have eight regional hospitals, this was limited to our main campus facility. And we reviewed over 1,400 aneurysm repair cases. And really just some of the background, uh, one third of those cases were roughly open uh, aneurysm repair, another third fenestrated or branched aneurysm repair, and the last third is uh, standard EVAR uh, repair. And there are some interesting uh, facts that we found in looking at that 1,400 uh, count uh, case over five years. Essentially, we see that 80% of those open aneurysm uh, cases are actually complex pararenal juxtarenal anatomy. Uh, we think that this has some implications in terms of how our trainees and our, our graduates of our program uh, perform, but we think it has some further implications as we look at our quaternary care experience, knowing that there are other uh, regional hospitals and quaternary care centers that have the same experience. How should we be training our graduates? What should we expect of them? Is the paradigm of how we train vascular surgeons changing? So I have here uh, Dr. Leiden, and maybe I'll ask you to begin some questions about what do you think, where do we stand with the training of vascular surgeons for open aneurysm repair? How has that evolved? So I think if we look nationwide, we're sort of at a crisis. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, when endovascular or EVAR was just starting, uh, we were doing high-risk patients and 10 to 15% of our patients were getting EVAR. Now, if you look across the United States, it's 85%. Uh, 20 years ago, when trainees were training, they did 30 to 50 open aneurysm repairs and still felt marginally comfortable when they came out to do these kinds of cases and needed help of their senior partners. Now, the average number of open repairs done by a trainee is 10. And a matter of fact, this last year, there were 10 graduates of a vascular surgery training program who'd never done an open aneurysm repair. And, and I think it's our belief here at the clinic that that degree of experience of 10 or less is not gonna allow you to be comfortable doing this out in practice. So what does that mean in terms of the training, the current training paradigm? We have the vascular surgery residency, we have the vascular surgery uh, fellowship. How should that evolve? So I think we're going to redo what happened 20 years ago. So when endovascular came about, there, were not an, there was not enough expertise across the United States to train all the vascular surgeons how to do angioplasty stents and endovascular aneurysm repair. So there became centers of excellence that had advanced training programs that we first started taking people in practice to give them the skill set. Many of our first people coming through this were chairs of vascular surgery departments and other divisions, and then eventually to private practitioners and eventually to recent graduates. And you know, over the last 10 years to 15 years, everybody gained that skill set. The that has come at the expense of having an open skill set. So I think the big discussion now in the Society for Vascular Surgery in a lot of places is how we're gonna get uh, our next generation trainees able to do open surgery. And I think what you're gonna start seeing is centers with the volume like ours, that are coordinary referral centers are gonna eventually start doing fellowships for people to get this kind of experience. We're fortunate that our trainees come out having the experience of doing anywhere between 50 and 75 open aneurysm repairs and feel very comfortable going into practice doing that where the average trainee does not. And so I think that one of two things will happen. People will go into practice and not incorporate this into their practice and open patients will coalesce into bigger quaternary referral centers or we will also see the advent of these postgraduate training programs for people to get training. I mean, if you look at orthopedics 20 years ago, the general orthopedics did everything. They did hips, knees, shoulders, trauma. And now it's rare that you know you go to a, the Cleveland Clinic and you're gonna have somebody who does hips and only hips, someone only does knees. And so I, I think that we'll continue to see the secondary subspecialization of vascular surgery similar to other specialties. 
Yeah, I, I think the the experience of our trainees is is kind of interesting in that we don't really start with a standard open aneurysm in training people now because the standard open aneurysm, the straightforward anatomy, is really an EVAR. And at this point, when you look at the number of cases that are, you know, a suprarenal or supraciliac clamp, and to, to think that that's how trainees are learning uh, aneurysm, open aneurysm surgery is, is quite remarkable and it's problematic to, to some extent that we don't have those straightforward cases uh, to train them on. And I think that's exactly the point. When you could clamp below the kidney arteries and do a tube graft, there wasn't a concern of having too long of a lower ischemia time. Uh, generally, if you had a long enough neck, if there was something technically challenging of what the trainee had done, you could redo it. It didn't put the patient at any risk. And so there was ample opportunity for learning. When you start clamping above the renals or above the viscerals, the longer your clamp times clearly can have a large effect on outcome. And so it's going to take more cases to get the trainees to be able to independently perform that by the time they're done, as well as, you know, they're not going to do as much early on until they're actually technically there. And if they have less experience in programs, it's, you know, it's, it, it's a concern. I mean, I, I didn't have a concern of how I'd have an open aneurysm repair if I needed it when I'm in my 80s. And now I sit there and think, well, what if I needed it in my 80s? Who's going to be around to do it other than places like the Cleveland Clinic? Sure, sure, absolutely. I guess the final implication in this pattern of referral is that how do we get patients to the destination where they can be treated? What do you think are the components of having a regional vascular surgery aortic referral center? So I think the two things it has to start with is both transparency and reporting of outcomes. And so if you collect your outcomes and you report them, you know, there's ways to know where centers are having good outcomes doing these kinds of cases. And so uh, doctors want with best for their patients, patients want the best outcomes. And, you know, unfortunately right now there's not great systems to look uh, with transparency of how many a site is doing and what their outcomes are. And, and I think that really when you have a hard look at, you know, these kinds of procedures, similar to the way coronary bypass grafting has and aortic valve replacement and registries, there's come become transparency across the United States and outcomes. And so people can know if someone is a, a qualified center with good outcomes. And I think that's coming in, in aortic disease as well. It's already one of the nine metrics hospitals are graded on in the U.S. News and World Report, so you can look it up there. But I think as there's more transparency in how patients do, I think it becomes easier to look at where those referral centers are because you're going to see the results first. I, I think that's important, uh, the quality, and I think it's important also, you know, people understand that the quality of outcomes related to open aneurysm impair is not only related to the individual surgeon, but it's related to the inter, the institutional experience because it is a systems approach to managing those patients um, during the operation, but equally as important perioperatively. How about getting those patients? You know, I think our our air transport, our emergency air transport uh, system that kind of piggybacks off of our um, acute aortic program and our um, coronary program, I think that's critical to getting patients in this tri-state area to the clinic. I think that's right. I mean, we basically have a policy for any acute aortic emergency, whether it's a symptomatic or ruptured aneurysm, a, a dissection, uh, or, you know, any kind of aortic tear, our policy is there's always a bed and we'll always get him here. And so, you know, I think that really if you want to have a center of excellence, you have to have an open door policy and it's get people here first and figure out what needs done second. And so they come to a joint unit that both cardiology, cardiac surgery and vascular surgery are all brought it to the bedside and then we forgot how best to coordinate those patients care and outcome. And so, you know, I'm really proud of that effort that we have, that a joint effort, and it doesn't just start with getting them here, it's then managing them until they're surgically fixed, if and how that that's possible, and then the critical care team afterwards working with the surgical teams to make sure the patients have the best outcome going home. Yeah, it, it really is a, uh, a team of teams, as uh, Dr. Svensson likes to, to uh, stay state. And I think that's very important in, in caring for these patients. It has to be a programmatic approach. And, 
Um, I guess this paper really falls within the heart of what we do here at the Cleveland Clinic in terms of the clinical care, the educational care, and the research and trying to uh, kind of publish and tell people what we do and how we do it. I think that's really critical and you know when it was presented there was a lot of discussion that went out of you know how do you keep those sort of volumes and I think part of it is we've had dedicated teams to doing this we've been transparent with what we do and we accept all comers and so uh, we've been fortunate we have all the various options to offer patients but I think as as time goes on uh, this is going to be a, a difficult problem for many training programs to try and provide that kind of experience for someone coming out as a board certified vascular surgeon at many programs in the future. Because it's pretty clear we're not going back in terms of the technology that allows right. us to perform more and more procedures. As we have successful minimally evasive options, uh, that's a better approach. Uh, but unfortunately, if you look at patients, only about 60% of patients have good anatomy to have a great outcome with an endovascular approach. In the United States, about 85% are done that way, which means there's a lot of patients done with less than favorable anatomy, and we also have a bridging referral base of dealing when those don't work so well. And so I think it's really trying to put the right treatment on the right patient to have the best outcomes. And if you have all those tools in your toolbox, you make a much better decision than trying to see every nail with one hammer. And that's probably a, a future uh, topic at which we can continue on another discussion, the explant uh, program and that increasing number of patients that have failed endovascular uh, repairs and I think you've published a little bit on that topic. We have. It's, uh, it's, you know, not every repair goes well and we're happy to do anything we can to, to help re-repair uh, failed repairs. Super. Well, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate you uh, listening to our, our podcast or, or viewing our video and we'll see you soon. Thank you.